Hello, I'm Andrew Fanning. Let's take a look at how countries are doing with respect to the goal of meeting the needs of their residents within fair shares of planetary boundaries. I'm really interested in how we can use data and metrics as tools to help make the urgent 21st century challenges that we face visible and compelling and widely accessible to as many people as possible. And I think it's important because data underpins the economic story of progress that we have inherited from the 20th century. These 20th century systems have been created to expect and depend upon endless expansion, which is reflected in national policy with the goal of increasing economic activity, GDP growth, as the primary measure of an economy's success, no matter how rich that country already is. But in our 21st era of rising inequalities and ecological breakdown, a single blunt measure of the total volume of transactions in an economy is simply not a useful proxy for overall prosperity, if it ever was. Instead, we offer the donut as a vision for 21st century prosperity in a world where the goal is not to increase economic activity, but to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And this image shows a world dangerously out of balance, where billions of people worldwide are falling short of meeting their most essential needs, while at the same time, humanity is collectively overshooting multiple planetary boundaries. It shows our urgent need for a global economic system that can bring us into the donut from both sides at the same time. And that is a challenge that, that the system we have inherited was not designed to address. So we need transformative action underpinned by new theories, new models, new policies, and new metrics that are fit for these times. But if we actually start designing and applying new policies for specific places, then it becomes clear that this global picture is missing some important context. Because humanity is not a single entity. There are vast inequalities in the lived experiences of people both within and between countries. Nations vary hugely in terms of the global responsibility for overshooting planetary boundaries, which is overwhelmingly driven by the excessive consumption of the wealth. And at the same time, nations are very diverse in their capacity to provide a decent social foundation for their residents, especially in the global south where the extractive legacy of colonialism lingers on. One way to unpack and make visible these differences is by comparing country performance with respect to the donut across as many indicators and countries as possible. And this is what we did in a recent study that covered nearly 150 countries. So let's look at four countries across a range. And let me start with Kenya. With a level of economic activity equivalent to only $5,000 per person per year, we can see that Kenya is massively falling short on meeting its residents' essential needs. There's a lot of red in the hole of that donut. But it's not overshooting fair shares of any of the ecological indicators that we measured. And then we have China, partly falling short and already an overshoot, so it's got the double whammy that we see at the global level of needing to meet people's needs and come back within planetary boundaries at the same time. And then we have Denmark, one of the best performing countries in the world in terms of social performance, achieving minimum sufficiency thresholds for nearly all of the social indicators that we measured, at least based on this global international standard. But it is substantially overshooting its pressure on the planet. Other high-income nations have a similar picture, although the United States is a particularly extreme example of overconsumption and massive overshoot beyond its fair shares of planetary boundaries. Now, if you want a better news example, we find Costa Rica, comes the closest to living within the donut out of all the countries that we analyzed, and with a fraction of the economic activity that is observed in high-income nations. Now clearly every place has its own context and its challenges, but I think it's fair to say that Costa Rica's emphasis on providing universal basic services, such as education and health, as well as its successful reforestation policies over the past decades, could offer insights for other countries. Now here's nearly a hundred nations. This chart shows the number of social thresholds that are achieved versus the biophysical boundaries that are transgressed. You can see Kenya in the bottom left, China and Costa Rica, and Denmark and the United States up in the top right. And the goal is to be in the top left where we achieve all of the social thresholds without transgressing any of the boundaries. But as you can see, not a single country can put up its hand and say that it's there. So every nation must transform to get into the donut albeit by following different pathways and in different ways. 
Now this chart uses data from the most recent year to show a snapshot of country performance. But we also wanted to know about country performance over time to understand if any countries are on track, were any countries headed towards the donut? And the answer to that question is unfortunately not, as far as we can see. Now here's a picture of the country pathways that we found since the beginning of the 1990s, where countries are colored according to their starting positions at the beginning, and lines show their country pathways over the analysis period. Overall, we find that countries tend to transgress most or all of the biophysical boundaries before achieving a substantial number of social thresholds. They generally move from left to right along the bottom of the chart before they start moving up. And we see a group of low-income countries in the bottom left and another group of high-income countries in the top right who don't seem to have moved very much based on these measures. And there's another group of low or middle-income countries who have reached more social thresholds over the period, which is good, but they have also transgressed more biophysical boundaries, which is less good. And once again, Costa Rica stands out for transforming resources into social achievement more efficiently than any other country, although it still transgresses half of the planetary boundary indicators that we analyzed. To illustrate country progress over time, we can look again at three countries across the range. Now Nigeria and the United States are in those low income and high income groups of countries who didn't show much change in terms of the number of social thresholds or biophysical boundaries that are achieved or transgressed in the chart that I just showed. But what was not so clear by looking at this overall number of boundaries transgressed is that the extent of ecological overshoot in most high income nations has generally been increasing since the 1990s. This chart shows a set of countries plotted by the overall extent of ecological overshoot compared to their overall extent of social shortfall. And we want to be again in that green area in the top left where no country currently is meeting the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And we need to remember that these nations are not all living totally separate realities. Their stories are deeply interconnected through history and through power, through a history of colonialism, military and corporate power, and current relations of debt and trade rules that are skewed in favor of the global north, through ongoing destruction of ecosystems, through extraction of resources, and the impacts of climate change, which are overwhelmingly driven by overconsumption of the richest, and yet their impacts are being felt first and hardest by the most vulnerable. So we can see the historical pathway offered by the pursuit of endless GDP growth is not moving countries into the donut. And this is not to say that all growth is bad though. It's instructive to look to nature. Yes, growth is a healthy phase of life, but everything in the living world eventually grows up and it matures. And only then at some sweet spot of sufficiency do things flourish. So at very low levels of resource use, we can see a small increase improves social performance dramatically as countries build up the critical provisioning infrastructure that is required to meet their essential needs, such as roads or hospitals or schools, water treatment and sanitation, energy, internet, and much more. But eventually, countries build up enough essential provisioning capacity. And beyond this turning point of sufficiency, higher levels of aggregate resource use are associated with little to no improvement in fundamental social outcomes. So there is an urgent need to reimagine what it means to achieve human prosperity in the 21st century with a vision that doesn't assume that it depends on endless GDP growth. And we can think of the world's lowest income countries today, like Kenya, which are very far from meeting their people's needs, but are, that are placing very little pressure on our planet. How can they rise up towards getting into the donut without shooting past? That'd be a pathway that has never been taken before. Then we can think of the countries facing that double whammy of needing to meet the needs of their residents for the very first time, while coming back within fair shares of planetary boundaries, like China and other emerging economies. How can they devise new policies and pursue a new vision that reorients their economies 90 degrees away from the growth-based trajectory, which has also never been traveled before? And then let's think of the high-income countries like Denmark or the United States, who like to tell the rest of the world that they are developed. Well, they too need a lot of ambition and humility to undertake an unprecedented transformation, meeting the needs of their residents while massively reducing resource use 
to come back within planetary boundaries. That's never been done. It's a new journey that requires new vision, new ambition, and new policies. And that's why we at Donut Economics Action Lab never use the terms developed or developing countries, because from the perspective of the donut, we are all developing countries. And let's not forget the need to rebalance the unjust international system that we have inherited. Where Global North countries who benefit from the extractive legacy of colonialism start to make reparations to those who are suffering the losses and damages that are caused by those actions. So these results show that humanity has entered an unprecedented era that demands transformation within all countries, some far more than others, and also between them. Now, some viewers may be data nerds like me, and they want to know more about the data sources, the indicators, the boundaries, and the analysis that is underpinning the high-level results that I have been showing here. And the best places to find these deep methodological details are published in two peer-reviewed scientific articles, which my co-authors and I tried really hard to write as well as we could, so please do read them. And we've also tried hard to make all our research results widely accessible through an interactive website hosted by the University of Leeds that I have been developing on an ongoing basis since 2018. And let me share a quick overview of this website to illustrate a few ideas of how it can be used to foster and inform a public debate about what it means to live well within the means of the living planet. And I promise I'll try not to let my data and nerdiness get the best of me. Okay, so here we are on the homepage of the Good Life for All Within Planetary Boundaries website. I won't go into detail on all of the content and visualizations and things that are available to explore on this page, although I do warmly encourage and invite you to, to check that out on your own time. You can find time series information, national snapshots, there's related research from other studies, you can download data for both of these studies as well as find additional information. There's media coverage in the news and further information about us. So what I wanted to briefly show is how we can, can take these charts that I was showing in as images previously and start using them interactively to explore how countries compare with others with respect to the goal of achieving a safe and just future for all. And I'll do that by jumping into the Pathways page which shows these charts that should be familiar from earlier, where you can see the number of boundaries transgressed or the number of social thresholds achieved, as well as seeing how they change over time. So at the early 1990s, this is what the picture looked like, and we can, we can explore how that trajectory was changing over time. And if we hover over individual bubbles, you can actually see the trajectories of those. So here's China, Here's India, here's the United States, Costa Rica. And likewise, you can also explore the extent of ecological overshoot or social shortfall. Once again, seeing how those trajectories have changed over time. And likewise, you can zoom in on individual countries. And if you're having trouble finding a country, then you can actually also use this this list if you hover over the country to see how they're doing. So here is Costa Rica, for example. And if we click on any of these countries, then it takes us to the national donut, in this case of Costa Rica. And here you can see once again how the performance has changed across each of the social and ecological indicators that we analyzed. And likewise, you can select from the nearly 150 countries that we explored, that we analyzed throughout. So here is the Spain, for example, which is where I am based. And if you go down further, actually you can find additional details on each of the biophysical and social indicators with respect to the biophysical boundaries. And again, this is interactive in a way that hopefully can make it easier to understand the, the quite a large amount of information. So here I'm highlighting the material footprint of Spain with respect to its biophysical boundary. We can do the same for CO2 emissions. And likewise, if you hover over the map, you can see the absolute values as well as the performance with respect to the boundary on the y-axis. So for example, at the end of the period in Spain in 2015, their material footprint was nearly three and a half times beyond the biophysical boundary that we identified. 
And likewise, for social indicators, you can dive as deep as you want into the information, uh, exploring what are the thresholds that we identified, as well as how performance has been moving over time. And likewise, if you want to zoom in on individual indicators, then you can use this list to see how they have been changing. You can download data for this individual country, which is a bit more manageable than downloading the data of the entire data set, which starts to be a lot, and find additional links as well. So this is just a, a very brief overview of what the information can be used to explore. You can, of course, pull out as much as you would like or dive as deep as you would like. And the whole purpose of it is that it is used and it's widely accessible and starts to inform a conversation of what it means to live well within the means of the living planet. So there you have it, a brief introduction to how countries are doing with respect to the donut's social and ecological boundaries, together with a quick overview of resources to explore and compare results for your own country on our interactive website. And I really want to emphasize that we see these globally comparable cross-country results as a starting point for further research and action that is inspired by the donut at many scales, from neighborhoods to nations and beyond. So thanks for listening and please do dive in.